MTMV Sports Podcast Network. My team, my voice, for the fans, by the fans. Welcome to Red and Bold. Welcome to Red and Bold. We have a, a special guest on the show today. I'm your host, Will Smith, my co-host, Joe Mobley, and we have our special guest, BJ Kissel. Welcome, BJ. Appreciate you guys having me on. Glad to have you, man. Glad to have you. Yeah, and for, for those of you that don't know, BJ um, was a Kansas City Chiefs reporter for six years. Um, he transitioned about two years ago, you said, in twenty after 2019 season. He uh, transitioned and started his own uh, company called Kansas City Sports Network. And so uh, he's handling that right now. And we're just happy to have him on the show and get his thoughts on the Chiefs currently as they are. Um, before we jump into it, we're going to recognize our sponsors. We got J-Mo's Barbecue. Be sure to upgrade your meats and get some of that great barbecue sauce from J-Mo's. That's www.jmosbbq.com. And also sponsored by Waywater Entertainment. Get your faith-based comic book, Legacy AD. Um, this talk is a faith-based uh, comic book. Uh, talks about a man named Deacon Foster who has been chosen by God to uphold justice and battle evil. So um, check out Legacy AD. That's LegacyADCartoon.Squarespace.com. And yeah, we about to jump into it with BJ and ask some questions and see see what his thoughts are on the, the season as it may be. Um, the first question that we have, and uh, this is our first quarter question. First, the first quarter. quarter um, in your opinion, this question comes directly from Joe Mobley, our co-host. <laughs> he said, in your opinion, what is the missing element and or ingredient that must be addressed for the Chiefs um, to become the dynasty all Chiefs fans hope to see? Ooh. Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, I don't want to give the, the easy answer. It's just health. You know, we just need everyone to stay healthy. Yeah. Uh, I know we're one and two in, in Chiefs fans. <laughs> I think you... You get a pulse of Chiefs fans on Twitter, and you get a Chiefs uh, uh, pulse of Chiefs fans everywhere else. You're going to get two entirely different scenarios where I feel mm-hmm. like most people uh, understand that even at one and two, um, that besides some fumbles, some turnovers, the Chiefs mm-hmm. could easily be three and zero. Oh. They could easily be zero oh and three. To be yeah. honest, yeah, uh, that's just the parody in the NFL. Is the Chiefs haven't played well, and they've still almost beat some of the best teams in the AFC. So that perspective kind of needs to stay there, but. To your point and to your question, I think as long as Patrick Mahomes is healthy, you're always going to have a chance to win. It's not above criticism. Not a, it, We've seen that he's capable of actually going out and not playing well in the game, and the Chiefs aren't able to still uh, come back and pull that out. But if they're able to stay healthy with the leadership that they have uh, on both sides of the ball, and I'm talking guys like Tyron Matthew, guys like Patrick Mahomes, and when you have Andy Reid, if you've got talent and you have leadership, everything else will work itself out as long as you stay healthy where over the course of the season, the chiefs are still going to be in it at the end, Mm. Um, but they've got to stay healthy and you've got to, to maintain those leaders. So uh, if you're looking at a dynasty, they need to keep Tyron Matthew. I don't care how old he gets. I don't care how slow he gets. Uh, Tyron Matthew is a guy that you keep in that locker room. I personally got to see it for the last year. I was there. I got to see the difference that he made uh, in the leadership and holding guys accountable at that level. Um, nobody's going to slack off in the middle of the season if things start to not go the right way. And so for me, for a dynasty, you have to have talent and leadership. They've got it with Coach Reed. They've got it with Patrick Mahomes. He's not going anywhere. They need to do it on the defensive side of the ball. And Tyron is that guy, in my opinion, uh, to hold it all together. Uh, and then they will be, I don't want to say they're going to win 12 Super Bowls uh, or six Super Bowls, but mm-hmm. they're going to be in it. Every single year, they're going to be relevant and they're going to be fun to watch, um, regardless of what happens. I know it pisses everybody off to watch the games now, but let's not mm. pretend that they're still not entertaining and you're right. still not glued glued to your seat. You're mad, but you're yeah. still watching it. Yeah, I think uh, this was the first time um, that Mahomes, when he got the ball, kind of got the ball last towards the end of the game, the, char- the Chargers game specifically, where you know, like, ah, oh, we we got time, we about to. It's tied 24, 24. We about to go down the field and score. And and this was the first time where it looked a little, you know, a little shaky. And some people now may be, for some reason, doubting Mahomes and kind of losing uh, hmm. their faith in him. What would you say to those who are starting to question uh, Mahomes' ability? Is he becoming nervous in the pocket or not used to it? Or I think it's just the instant gratification society that 
you know, if you don't fix, if you're not playing well in the first half and you don't fix it by the second half, then you're incapable of fixing what's broken. Like we don't allow for development. We don't allow for to have a bad game and to fix it. We always promote. And I put this on social media after the game. I'm not trying to be a wet blanket or trying to be the sky's not falling guy, but we praise having leaders and the right people in place to right the ship when things aren't going well, but we don't give the grace to allow the time to see those things manifest themselves. Like we praise having leadership, let them lead. Like you can't lead when everything's going well. Leadership is when things are, are not going well. And then when it comes to the chiefs, the last few years with Patrick Mahomes losing two games in a row is like, Oh my God, what's happening. Yeah. We have to fire everybody. And it's just like, hold on. <laughs> like I remember 2011 or whatever it was, we were nine weeks. We didn't even have a lead in a football game. So like, before we start throwing around, let's fire everybody. The grass isn't always greener on the other side. Like there's not always answers to everything, but, uh, but yeah, I, I'm the, probably the, the most pragmatic person in the world. I think it's my baseball background as a relief pitcher. So it's always like the next pitch, the next thing. Like I don't stew on what just happened a whole lot. And luckily that's the way that most high level people, I wouldn't even say sports people. I think people just in general, when you are you know, confronted with an obstacle in your life, you have two choices. You can like complain about it and stew about it, or yeah. you get to work and you figure out how do I fix this? How do I get around this? those guys are wired to fix the problem. So while fans sit around because they can't do anything about it on four days right. on social media, just complaining, saying these guys have to get better. You know what those guys aren't doing on social media, complaining, like they are working, like they are doing what they are supposed to do. And so I'm not worried as somebody that's been around them just because I know the processes that they go through and that they have leaders, they have talent, it'll work itself out. Uh, but that being said, you go out there, you don't play well weeks, two and three, and you lose games, you should win. You are making it more difficult on yourself at the end of the season where you might not get that week 17 by, or you may have to play. You might not get home field advantage because of that one loss. So it's not that it doesn't matter, but it doesn't matter in this, in the scheme of the scope of fire, everybody, we have to make these wholesale changes. It's just, no, don't fumble the ball. Don't turn it over four times yeah, against the good yeah. team. And expect to win. <laughs> That's yeah. it. Yeah. And that's the scary part that to for me, that is, that is the scary part. And this, this is kind of, you know, conundrum oxymoron type stuff, but the scary part is I'm not scared anymore. And, 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 (laughs) and after you talk about seasons like 2011, where, you know, in the most opportune situations, I don't know how devastating and how traumatic it was as a fan to see us have the opportunity to have the time on the clock. And mm-hmm. we just didn't have the talent. We didn't have the the pieces. We couldn't, we couldn't put it together. So yeah, it's a little disappointing when I look at games two and three, but again, the scary part for me has been is that there's this part of me that wants to reference the fear or that like, Oh my God, here we go again. And I don't feel that way anymore. And it's like, I, I don't even know how you get around that sometime. That is the is part that, weird. Yeah. And I've had this discussion. Is that supreme arrogance? And this is yeah. like a philosophical discussion. Mm-hmm. Is it like we tell, like I've been telling Chiefs fans since Patrick yeah. Mahomes, like 2018, like don't become Patriots fans. Like yeah. don't mm-hmm. become those people that you can't stand. And then it's just like, if somebody praises Josh Allen on social media is like, Hey, he's got the most arm talent in the world. Chiefs fans nowadays are just like, you know what? No way. Like that guy, sucks. he's our guy. Like, Josh Allen's a phenomenal quarterback. He's one of the most talented yeah. players in the league. It's okay yeah. for other people to be good. And to the same point that you just made, is it supreme arrogance that we're not worried? Like, I'm not worried about the Chiefs, even though they've gotten lose. Right. Sorry to have the attitude of like, yeah, it made it more difficult on themselves, but they'll figure it out. They're fine. Like, they've got the leaders. Yeah. They got everything that they need to do this. And I don't know for myself, it's just because I, I know some of the guys personally, not all of them. I haven't been there two years. Some of the new guys I don't know. But the guys who are there, like, I know how they operate, so I'm not worried. But yeah. I also don't know if that's just like, we're so good that we're going to be there at the end. Who cares about this piddly little week <laughs> three game? Like, you, Chargers, man. enjoy your September win. Go take <laughs> right. it. Right. You and the Raiders can go take a lap around Arrowhead and celebrate. Yeah. Go make a freaking T-shirt for winning a week <laughs> three game. But yeah. um, you got to do it consistently. Mm-hmm. But that being said, like, Chargers are legit. They just needed yeah. to stay healthy and – apparently get rid of Philip Rivers and they're going to be all right. Yeah, I think it's, it's the not necessarily arrogance. I think it's just the context of the losses. Um, if you look at the, the Ravens game, that game was essentially won if Clyde just holds on to the ball. 
Like we all know that that's going to be a W. Look at the Chargers game. The Chiefs offense was was rolling on each of those drives before those three turnovers prior to the, the, the last one in the fourth. But those three, they were driving and they were already in scoring position. So it's like right. eliminate those turnovers. And, and it's probably not as close a close game with the Chargers. And so, yeah. yeah, let's go to the second quarter. We're going to ask our second quarter. question here, which is or second topic. This is Joe again, <laughs> but but a lot of people are asking. This is something that kind of like, OK, is he or is he not? It says who's really calling the plays when it's all said and done? Is it Andy Reid or Eric B. Enemy? And that's always like a, a question. So. Coach Reid has done a really good job of and I'm not going to say he's misled the media, but I will say this going back to Doug Peterson when he was there with the Chiefs in 2015. In about week, I think it was week 10, week 11, the Chiefs had gone on that crazy winning streak. Mm -hmm. Uh, So they started one in five and they won like seven games or whatever it was. They won a bunch of games. They won like 10 games in a row. Yeah. And so they had asked Doug Peterson, I'll never forget, it was the Steelers game, was the first win in that streak. It was the first one where they they started it. Mm -hmm. And somebody like at the end of that season, because Doug was, he'd already got the job at the Eagles. That was already a done deal before, Mm -hmm. like three weeks ago in the season. But anyway, they had asked like, you know, when is Doug calling plays? Like if he's going to be a head coach, the big thing with Andy Reid is he calls plays. So every coordinator he ever has is criticized as being, he's never called plays. He can't be the guy. Mm-hmm. It's never consistent. And that like Eric bien has called plays. Matt Nagy called plays. Doug Peterson called plays, but they're pretty tight to the vest on when they do it. He's publicly mm-hmm. said at times that he'll give once. And I want to be careful about the way that I word it because it's not about being me not having trust or Doug Peterson not having trust. And I don't know if it's every single week. I know that there were weeks where like Doug had the two minute drill because that's a completely different game plan. The way that the calls are made are just shorter. They're shorter to the point. Everything is just more concise. And it's such a specific game plan that the game planning for the regular part of the game in the first 15 and all that scripting in the two minute is just a different thing. So he would give the two minute to his coordinators. Now, I don't know how consistent that is, but to go back to trying to pull information out of Andy Reid during a press mm-hmm. conference, I remember that year he said, somebody asked, like, when did Doug start calling plays? He goes, oh, the second half of the Steelers game. And it's like nine weeks after we're <laughs> winning. And it's just like, you're just giving Doug a job. Like, you're just trying to help your guy, like your boy yep. get a job. And that's the way the coach is. That's why everybody loves him. Is it true? I have no idea. Like, no one's mm-hmm. ever going to be able to prove it either way. Right. But it's just like what plays did Doug call? And he'll say it every single time. He'd be like, the good ones. <laughs> like The ones that worked, he called. The ones that didn't work, I called. Yeah. So yeah. I have no idea. I will say that it is very uh, – I don't know if it's interesting. I only know the way that they've done it. I'm not going to pretend that I work for 15 other NFL teams and coaching staffs and how they do things. I do know that like when they make play calls, that there's like a shortened version of the play call. And my you know, God rest his soul, one of my closest friends, Therese Paler, years ago wrote a really, really good breakdown story on this about what happens when a call is made. And that like 40 seconds, here's how the information goes from Andy Reid to Eric bien to the quarterback, how Chase, at that time, Chase Daniel is the backup. How is he listening and helping kind of facilitate that whole process? And the easiest way I can explain it is that like Coach Reed will call the play of like what's executed. Mm-hmm. The enemy's job is then to spit out the entire um, play call, which includes the hash they're on, the formation, the personnel grouping. And so Reed will call the play, but the enemy is still very involved in adding every other layer to that, um, where Reed gives like the shortened version and then he takes like the big version. And so this may be the worst analogy and I've never used that, never used this until this show. And I'll probably get a text if somebody sees this being like that ain't even close to right. But it's like coach Reed to be like, Hey, we're ordering barbecue. And like the enemy would be like, okay, here's the specific order. Here's what everybody means by that. So like barbecue is they, everyone knows what barbecue is. It's a, you know, run to the side or whatever it is Mm -hmm. Uh, outside zone. And then the enemy would add all the layers to make sure everybody was lined up the way that they wanted within that play based on the rules and everything that they have. So, okay. so I, I don't know if that explains it, but like it does it the does. machinations of calling the machinations of calling plays. Eric mm-hmm. Bienemy is very much involved. The mm-hmm. strategy of when to call a certain play that's Andy Reed, except for in certain times and situations like two minute where he could just give it to him. You're never going to figure it out because the broadcast will show the enemy talking and they're like, oh, the enemy's calling plays. 
I just explained to you what that process looks like. So right. the media gets it wrong all the time because like, well, the enemy's calling plays. He's relaying. He relays the play. Reed gets it to him immediately. And then the enemy is the one who spits out the play call. And then the backup quarterback, which is like Chase Daniel, mm -hmm. will jump in at times where the enemy wow. gives the wrong hash. Mm -hmm. Or if he gives the wrong personnel, yeah. that's the backup quarterback's job. And there were times where Chase would jump in and he'd be like, no, 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 wrong hash. Or Alex would scream back at the sideline, like, no, that was wrong to Doug or whoever it was. So mm. it is a whole like communication a, process. Like There's a, a lot process. going on. <laughs> that is it's a lot. That's that the stuff intense. that I care about. Yeah. Like, so when I was working there as the Chiefs reporter, like I couldn't, you know, give the juicy, like, how do you feel about this player? Mm -hmm. But like I could ask those kinds of process oriented questions, and coach still wouldn't necessarily <laughs> want to share everything all the time. But mm. I was more caught up in like, what is actually happening like when you guys are all talking like what is this process and i was fascinated the more i would learn about how things kind of work behind the scenes when it comes to calling plays because it's like that with every single thing mm -hmm. it's a well-oiled machine and it's cool to see it kind of peek behind the curtain see it all work okay so the enemy is basically the one that's in patrick mahomes ear yeah train relaying the play yep. to him. i think okay. reeds i think and i could be wrong about this but i think reeds might can cut through like he can talk to anybody at any time that he wants okay. but in general the enemy is the one every play that's that's talking to read before the audio gets shut off like 10 seconds before the snap or 15 wow. whatever that is yeah that's a great breakdown that's that's, that's pretty good... awesome man yeah yeah, yeah. Try, Try. i like that i'm filled with a lot like... of useless information like this <laughs> These guys i like mean this I, stuff. I think that's awesome because i mean it really speaks to the quality control right aspect that yeah. doug peterson when you mentioned his name i mean that was that was pretty much at some point Ooh. i kind of thought was the whole ideal of kind of bringing him in to support and when you look back at that, you know, the way that they're doing stuff, it's not it's not just like it's, a, um, you know, just a whatever kind of some way, by the way, we're just going to throw this play out there. Mm -hmm. This oh, thing, yeah, no. this thing <laughs> is this thing is uh, it's extremely intense and in depth and strategic and and terribly thought out and evaluated like in real time by multiple people. And then. Mahomes finally gets a play in his helmet. Wow. I mean, I, I <laughs> that, just think that's that to me is exceptional. They that's have to exceptional. like Reed will know like the two or three plays depend yeah. like if it's first and 10 mm -hmm. and he calls the play, like after that play is done, before the clock even starts, he's got to get to the enemy the next play. So he already knows like it's going to be one of these two plays. Now, if they pick up a first down, it's going to be a different play on second and two than mm -hmm. first and 10 or second and nine, but he has to have like three or four plays in his mind based wow. on like what situation happens. So you don't have time. Like you don't have time to get the play call to be enemy. So like the call hat is at is to be enemy within like five seconds of the last play ending. That's how long it takes to get the information because the faster Mahomes can read the play, the faster he can get to the line, mm -hmm. the faster he can kind of see what's going on. And if he's got to make a check out of that, he can. Um, but yeah, it's that whole communication process uh, is fascinating. And the, the things that they have in place, like when the, like the, the tech goes out and they, they practice this stuff during the preseason, like third preseason game, they practice, Hey, all audio communication is out. How are we going to call mm -hmm. plays if we can't communicate to the guy? Wow. So like during preseason, when fans are like this game doesn't matter. And the coaches are like, Hey, we are going through things that matter. They don't ever get into the details, but it's stuff like that. Like, how do we call plays? So they just, all headsets are down in the second half. How do we communicate plays? How do we relay the information? And then it gives everybody reps on every portion or, part of what could happen during the season so you go you face other teams and everybody's scrambling because the audio is out and they don't know what to do and you'll never notice a difference with the chiefs because they already have answers for everything that's a that's awesome that you know, um great. that's great preparation but what i would love to see those that that ever happened with uh the audio equipment went out is for them for the chiefs to do like a college team and put like three pictures up <laughs> <laughs> And one, of them, and one of them have do we have time to run wasp <laughs> <laughs> i like when they get creative with them and just try to get people to like guess and have fun just because coaches are so stuck in their ways uh doing yeah. things that they've always done that then it becomes easy to kind of rip off uh mm. and steal signs and steal plays right. and whatever else you've got going on so you got to think differently those mm. big goofy signs i, love I mean is there a rock. point sometimes i feel like we keep the offense very like it's very, very plain, very, very vanilla. It, it almost seems as if we're, you know, um, holding 
something back. Hmm. Like we have so much more that, you know, many wrinkles we could, we could introduce or bring into something, but you know, it, it's almost like instead of us running something that is extremely intense or remotely would require that, I feel like we'll go to the general playbook and call a 22 dive. Like, you know, it's nothing special. There's nothing, no wrinkle, no lineman's going to pull. Nobody's going to hit the hole. Uh, no additional personnel. Nothing special is happening at all. I just feel like there's a part of the season where we keep everything, it seems like, to be as vanilla as possible. We just do it so well sometimes that it leads to to victories. You know, I love it, the you know the way that they would describe describe Andy Reid's offense, just window dressing that they'll run a 22 dive, but they're going to do a bunch of ghost action and a bunch of pre-snap motion. And they're going to get everybody right. running around. It's like, it looks like this crazy thing. And it's just the dive. They're just getting everybody moving around, trying to confuse everyone. Yeah. Uh, you can always tell when we, when we face uh, middle linebackers and mics that I don't want to say that we don't feel like communicate well, uh, but mics that are not as adept mm -hmm. to getting guys lined up when there's pre-snap motion or don't think that quickly, you can tell when our advanced scouting says like we, we can confuse this linebacker is all of a sudden one week you're going to see a ton of pre-snap motion guys moving all over the place yeah. that is saying we don't think their middle linebacker can get everybody lined up if we do all this stuff ahead of time and then when we don't it's like they, they're going to figure it out like we don't need to do this uh with all this window dressing to to glossy up like a basic play but uh but yeah i one of the a former chiefs plays not there anymore uh, but a couple of years ago told me that on one of the screen, they do that crazy motion where yep. Yep. McCole does it. Tyreek does it. He reverses back. And then they do like some screen to Travis. And then they got everybody going yeah. with every which way. And I asked him, I go, how many variations of that play do you have? And he said, 18. Wow. <laughs> I go, how many have you shown wow. in a game? He said three wow. and they've had it for like six years. So to your point, yes, they hold stuff back but he only calls it when it's set up for the reason that play was designed mm. was to take advantage of X player with X sort of um, skill set or tendency. And it's like, we're not going to call that play until we find the perfect situation to run that play. So, and then uh, sometimes I believe like, isn't the motion, the motioning of receivers or a tight end or any player on the offense to kind of for, for Pat Patrick <laughs> to gauge yeah to gauge what the defense is doing to see what kind of defense they type of defense that they might be playing. Are they playing them? You know, are they pressing? Are they in a, a zone coverage? Those type of things most time. Yeah. I think you get man zone IDs when guys are moving. You see guys travel most of the time it's man just in the basic. Now defenses know that. And a lot of interceptions you see are when defense is just a really good job of disguising mm -hmm. um, thinking that it's man and then guys drop off into a zone. But yeah. um, that's that chess match that, I'm not going to pretend to understand the tendencies and what they look for and why they do certain things. Mm -hmm. Cause when you start trying to get critical on a play and this is, you know, a blessing and a curse from, you know, having the keys or having the answers to the test mm -hmm. uh, for so many years, you know, I'd go watch the film and I'd ask the coaches and, you know, Matt Nagy, Doug Peterson, those guys were great for me as a guy that I'm not going to pretend to know the game at that level. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would just ask them like very simply like dumb questions that are very mm -hmm. basic Yeah. where this is more like for young media people when they get into it, I feel like a lot of people feel like they need to show how smart they are. If they're talking to a player or a coach and try to pretend like I, I have enough knowledge about this game that I'm on your level and I can talk to you. Mm -hmm. And what I try to tell every young media person is you will never be on their level with the knowledge of the game. And if you try to pretend they will sniff it out and they will tell very quickly, either you hundred percent do know this level and you've played or you've coached in the college, like you can speak this. And if you can't, don't fake it because they actually respect you more for just asking dumb questions. Cause all you're doing is showing that you appreciate the sport that they've dedicated their lives to in a very real way uh, mm -hmm. to ask those kinds of questions. But yeah, I think uh, when you get around to the chiefs offense, what makes it great. And mm -hmm. with Andy Reid is the variations, the way that they, they put guys in, in tough decisions and tough situations. If you see pre-snap motion a lot one week, it's to your point, either they're, they're confusing the DBs on their rules on like, you've got, you've got two or you've got three and guys are motioning. We saw it on the chief side with the touchdown that we had a blown coverage. Mm, um, yeah. Yeah. We, we didn't know if it was Sorensen covering the two or whoever that was, it was based on that pre-snap motion where, Sorensen, they didn't know who was covering which mm. guy because right off the snap, it was right in that little um, yeah. wow. tough area. And they were yeah. playing our rules against us. And it's a brilliant play design. And it's just one of those, like, you got us. Like, you just 
he yeah. got got and so anyway. those blown coverages yeah. man are so disappointing <laughs> and it's yeah, blown it's, it's like yeah. oh if he had just knew what to know what to do but okay great great uh Great answer, BJ. Appreciate it, man. Uh, we're gonna go to the third, third quarter. Ding, 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 quarter. Ding, third quarter. Uh, does Josh Gordon make the Chiefs offense more deadly or hmm. are our expectations too high? Wow. Depends what your expectations are. <laughs> so <laughs> well, I, I watched I watched the 2019 film, right? That was like the the okay. most recent when he's with the Patriots and then so, some a little bit with the, the Seahawks. And when I watched the, the Patriots film, I was like. Yo, like he's still, you know, and he, he doesn't have a lot of tread on tire because he's missed so much. And for me, 30 years old is not that old for me. Like I, for some reason, the NFL moniker is once you turn 30, you're done. Like you've you've you washed up or you you've lost a step. Yeah. And I I think you can't make the case that he's not one of the physically athletically most six top six gifted receivers for the chiefs. So I know I'm going very basic here, but there is no way you can say that he doesn't make us better. Even if you don't think that he's going to be anything close to what he was, Mm -hmm. you're talking about a top six receiver. If he gets called up right now, he's on the practice squad. Mm -hmm. There are no expectations for anything other than guys on the practice squad. If he shows that he can still play, that he's got the athleticism that he can have those six to 10 packaged play. Let's not pretend he's going to know the whole offense. He's going to know six to eight right. plays in the first game he plays in. And he's going to run out on the field knowing like the day before the game is like, I, there's, if I get in, it's going to be one of these six to eight plays that I'm running. And it's like, can he go out there, create a little separation and make a play? Yeah, I think he can. Do I think he's going to get 700 yards this season? No. Do I think he's going to make three or four big third down type plays where you're going to be like, that's why we went and get him? Yes. Do I think we get him because the Marcus Kemp play? that I'll criticize Patrick Mahomes because it wasn't a good throw. Wow. It wasn't a good throw. I, I battled with Kent Swanson on that because Kent was going to defend everything Mahomes does. Like, hey, I get it. He tried to throw a no-look pass. He didn't mm-hmm. set his feet. He threw it behind the receiver. Receiver should have caught it, but it should have been a better pass for nobody within 15 yards of Marcus Kent. But does Josh Gordon make that catch, or do I feel more comfortable throwing the ball yes. to Josh Gordon? Yeah. And that sucks because I love Marcus Kemp, and he's yeah. one of those players. I was around for a long time, practice mm-hmm. squad earn that opportunity to get that to make that play and he's mm-hmm. going to get an opportunity to make another play with a special teams whatever it is but when you're looking at the chiefs you've got to have another guy that can step up and make plays and the other guys have now had three weeks to do it they're going to bring in another body and if josh gordon does nothing but get marcus kent demarcus robinson and mccall hardman to play that much better mm-hmm. overall it's still a net positive because the influence and the decision to bring him in made your team better whether it's because of him or the impact that he made on everybody else getting better. Guys are locked in a little bit more, whatever it is. Uh, it's a net positive. There's no risk. There's no reason that it shouldn't work, but let's have him get in the building, learn Andy Reed's offense, understand what's going to be asked of him because they don't call route. Now this could be different for, for Gordon. Cause he's new, but guys have talked about this over the years. Sammy Watkins talked about it. Demarcus Robinson talked about it. Chris Conley had a great quote years ago about Andy Reed's offense saying that it's not, it's a living, breathing thing. Mm-hmm. And when they call plays, not all the time, but they're calling concepts. The receivers don't know what route they're running until they line up wow. after they break and they see where the safeties are. They see where the leverage is. They are calling concepts. So once they see the safeties here, the leverage here, they then know where to go mm-hmm. to create that space for everyone. Mm-hmm. And so it's not just I'm going to line up and run a seven route or I'm going to run it out or like a comeback, whatever it is. It is, I'm going to line up, safety is over here, my cornerback is off, he's got inside leverage, so this is what my responsibility is. Mm-hmm. So when they talk about receivers learning the route, it's not learn, like, memorize the play call and then and what that means for your play call or concept in that wow. moment. And so mentally, there. play for Matt Nagy, Doug Peterson. He doesn't know the lingo necessarily. Um, it's not just a slam dunk that he's going to get it right. Like just run a nine route, just go and just yeah. trust that 15 ain't going to underthrow you. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how he plays out. But like, those are all the things that Josh Gordon is getting caught up to speed on right now. 
Gotcha. What's what's your thoughts, Joe? Like, what you think, Gordon? Just is? wondering, like, when it comes to Josh Gordon, I mean, I just see. I I think it was it was obvious to me game three. I really had an appreciation there for you know your perspective on it, Will, in regards to you know the missing ingredient or the missing uh, attribute that we needed was Sammy Watkins. That being said, I always uh, BJ have. Uh, kind of been a bit critical on Sammy. My thing is, is that, you know, it, it was great to have him on the team, but we rarely had him on the field. And that was a problem to me. I mean, I felt like, you know, the guy could get a, a an ingrown toenail and we were going to see him on a walker, you know, for about two, three weeks. And I mean, it just got old. And I mean, it, it was frustrating because he was so effective when he when he was actually playing. It made everything click. I just think God, maybe it's just me wanting to be optimistic for Josh Gordon, man. I am rooting for this guy from a whole different level. I just believe that I'm hoping that I, I don't expect to see him on Sunday, but I am hoping that we do see him the following week. If nothing else, I don't care if he doesn't know the six or eight plays they're going to give him yet, put him out there, let him run around and just disturb everyone. You will respect <laughs> his presence on the field or I feel like you will pay for it. I, I still feel like it's very much plainly exactly what you have said. Uh, we are talking about, uh, you know, at the end of the day, this guy having the ability to go out here and still get it done. He's going to be in the top, top six wide receivers. And I feel like if you just let him be, he's going to, he's going to rack up points, man. I, I, I like him. I think he's a game changer. I do believe that, Maybe he is that missing ingredient or attribute that brings, at least if nothing else, our offense back. And, uh, you know, as, as irritating as Sammy was, I got to say, he he had hands. When he My was on the field, the oh, when he was on the field, he was highly, you know, he was effective even if he wasn't getting the ball. We had to pay attention to him. And I think with um with Josh Gordon, can y'all hear me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Had to make sure my, my internet has been acting a little funny. But with Josh Gordon, I feel like teams are going to have to pay attention to him. Because if you don't, what, what, from, what I lo- from what I last saw and watched, he's great on those crossing routes. And he's a very physical 6'3", 225. He's almost like a tight end in a wide receiver's body. And we don't really have a wide receiver of that stature. Um, except for like maybe Darius Fountain, but he may be like six one. And I'd love for him to get an opportunity. Uh BJ and Joe, I feel like Fountain, he reminded me of Debo. <laughs> but yeah. Josh, but Josh Gordon, man, um, I feel like he will make a difference. And I feel like if he if he does to the even to the the point of how he played with New England, if he can if we get that Josh Gordon, there's no stopping this offense because you can't double Tyreek Hill anymore. You know what I'm saying? Or if you, you're gonna have to pick really pick your poison, you got so then you have Kelsey, Gordon, McCole Speed. Still gotta watch out for that. If they go four wide receiver sets, it's just it's just too much for defenses to because right now defense is just sitting back, like, okay, we'll double take Tyreek away. Y'all got Travis Kelsey. Who else is gonna do something? Yeah, I think Joe brings up a great point to your point. It's not even the impact that he can make, it's that. You go three by one, and you're like the Chargers, and you have that other safety who can kind of start to cheat over. Mm-hmm. He sees Gore, he sees 19 over there, and he's like, Ooh, I don't know if I want to leave this guy quite as open or, you know, as, uh, you know, free mm-hmm. as he was before. And it may take a couple of games of him yeah. reminding people yeah. that, like, hey, I can still make plays. But the best thing that could happen is the first game that Gordon plays now. I don't know if it's going to do great for expectations mm. of Gordon, but the best mm. thing it could do from a defensive coordinator, like Andy Reid sending a message, send them deep. Like if you make, if they hit on one big play with Gordon, mm. it will set the tone and the, the impact that that play will make will resonate more with the way things are called. Like, I don't know if I'm able to articulate this the right way. Mm. The impact of Josh Gordon making a big play early for the chiefs, in my opinion, will be seen more on things that we'll never understand because defensive coordinators will call things differently. We will mm-hmm. figure out ways to have success off of that because they saw the one play that Gordon made. So if we go three by one, they can't cheat a safety over. They, there's certain ways that we can just kind of 
space everyone out and they have to to choose kind of like they did to your guys's point with Sammy and it sucked with Sammy cuz I think a lot of times with with players they feel like it's the player's fault. And I know I think fans understand it's not Sammy's fault that he got hurt. Mm-hmm. But from yeah. being there, these guys are so big and so fast and their joints and their ligaments are not used to guys being that big and that fast for that point in their lives and eventually their body's just like no. Like you can't be this big, this fast with these kind of twitch muscles and not have these little like soft tissue issues, which is all of the issues that Sammy had. It was just, he was big, he's strong, he's fast. And his body was just like, you're not supposed to be like this quick with things. And that's why he had all his soft yeah. tissue issues. It gotcha. sucks because he's a different guy and a different yeah. cat, but like he loved, he liked being in Kansas city. Um, and he, I know his family liked it. He liked all of that. So I enjoyed having him around. I enjoyed I enjoyed getting to talk to him, but, uh, but yeah, it was disappointing that his body was just letting him down. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was definitely disappointed. I just know that when, like, what you were saying there, I call that that's that intangible added value that you're talking about, in my opinion, BJ. When you mm-hmm. start talking about just the simple fact, if you can get Gordon to make a play big right out of the gate, if that can happen, the mindset that that puts defensive coordinators in, in my opinion, is already even further disturbing now I, I i just i'm thinking that there have to be de- defensive coordinators out there that are saying i mean did they have to do this did this have to i mean i'm just feeling that maybe i'm wrong yeah. but there have to be defensive coordinators coaches out there saying good golly miss molly <laughs> this did not have to be be the case you know and not every defense is going to have a Joey Bosa up front and a Derwin mm-hmm. James on the back end where it's right. like, you know, what, we're going to play two safeties really deep and we're going to get after you with four and we're going to beg you and require you to be consistent and patient all the way down the field. And if one of these weeks we're going to play some single high team that likes to get after it and they're going to say, hey, we're going to blitz him, we're going to do mm. this, do that. Yeah. And they're going to realize why they shouldn't. Right. All right. Great one, great one, y'all. So let's go to the fourth quarter. Put your fourth fours quarter. <laughs> and so, uh, mm-hmm. will the Chiefs bounce back versus the Philadelphia Eagles? Hope so. They have like I. I'm excited about playing a more balanced team. Um, and the Chargers were a tough matchup for us coming off of Baltimore because you knew that mm-hmm. they were gonna. And we talked about this on our our content all last week, like you knew that the offense was going to want to go out and prove something and they were going to kind of like by sheer will wanting to go out there and you know, Mahomes is going to go throw for 600 yards and, and, you know, show and just that, that area, like that, that good arrogance about how good they are. They want to go show everybody Chargers were a bad matchup for that because Brennan Staley's defense is we're going to put two safeties really deep. We know we can get pressure with four and we're going to make you go underneath and be patient the entire game until you get, so frustrated or impatient that you try something you force something mm. and that happened yeah and so like that was a bad matchup in that way i don't know as much i haven't studied the eagles quite as much yet uh, but the brandon staley's defense is very unique in that way and so i'm excited about just playing i don't say a, a team that's not quite as good but just a normal balanced team you know baltimore was so unique with what they do with the running game and the run fits and all like that's not a a unique like traditional team to prepare for. So as a defense, you can't say like, we're awful. We're great based on facing Baltimore because they do things differently than everybody else. Mm. Um, I thought we were better against the Chargers, So I felt better against that. The run fits were better. Mm. They're not as good of a running team. So I thought in certain ways we were better until late in the game when they had to run and then we couldn't stop it, which was disappointing. Um, But in general, I'm excited to see us go up against just a, a normal, a good football team, but just like a normal balanced team to see where we're at as a defense. I thought after Baltimore, I wasn't going to bury the defense until we went up against the Chargers, which is a little bit more normal. You know, they throw the football a lot uh, offensively. And then the Eagles were going to give us a better idea of what kind of defense we have rather than Cleveland and Baltimore, which run first heavy on the O-line, like just a different kind of matchup. Uh, Mm. So I'm I'm excited to see how the defense turns it around. Hopefully we can get Frank Clark back out there and um, yeah. he can do something. What you got Joe with a with the Chiefs bounce back, Joe. Gotta have faith, man. Gotta have faith. No, I I really uh I really am I'm gonna hold firm and just I'm gonna stick stick with my guys, you know, till it's all said and done, man. I I, I hope that we that we bounce back. Um, 
I really just want to see uh, Patrick kind of do exactly what, you know, BJ was saying as far as really isn't, you know, an, an ideal defense to try to do it against. But I, I really would like to see us air out a couple of, of, of long balls successfully. And I also want to see us take advantage of teams that, that want to play that style of defense against us where you're going to post two safeties deep and tell us that we've got to take everything that you offer us underneath. Well, if that's just so happened to be the case, I, I really would like to see us, you know, kind of kind of go ahead and do that. If you want to give us everything underneath, I mean, I'm okay with 15, 20, 30 <laughs> yard gashes here and there. And the plays that we saw, like with Kelsey, where, you know, just coming across the coming yeah. across the middle of the field, we've got the personnel to take, you know, a, a 10 or 15 yard pass. I mean, it, it, it can happen quite frequently to the end zone you know mm -hmm. it's, it's possible so yeah man i'm going for the w that's my, <laughs> I, believe, I believe we're coming back yes sir and not um as far as taking the things like short and you know a lot of defense now trying to take away the deep ball i feel that that also works to our advantage because we have guys and we have a quarterback patrick a lot of the times hits guys in stride that allows them to get yardage after the catch we have great guys that are good after the catch with getting more yards, Kelsey, Tyreek, even uh, McCole, if you hit him in stride, he's hard to, to whew, you see that speed. Yeah. And then, and now you bring in the Josh Gordon, if you hit him in stride, he's, a lot of his yards, I saw were yards after the catch, 10 to 15 yards after the catch. And so I think that works to, to our advantage. Now the question is, will, will Patrick, take those because a lot of times he wants to get that big play and he's looking downfield deeper for the deep ball when he's got a guy open down under. And so I think it's just um for me from a fan standpoint, just take what they give you because you got guys that can still make a play even after catching the ball. And still like we saw Kelsey was that the Ravens game or where he took it all the way was at the I'm getting the games mixed up now, like where he went all the way. And I think that was the Ravens. He did that, but he did that in yeah. both games, but he yeah. did against oh, the right. Ravens. Yeah. Where it was, right. Yeah. That was, that was a ridiculous run. That's probably the best tight end run, you know, I've seen um, in, in as, as long as I have lived. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was pretty nice, man. Yeah. That's that was a nice run. So, I mean, we have, we have the players and like, like Patrick says, he just got to, um, put it in the playmakers' hands, let, let the playmakers make plays. And so I think I think we'll come out on top this game. I think Spags will. Jalen Hurts, I think he has less than 10 games starting, so he hasn't seen mm. a lot of defensive schemes and he hasn't seen a lot of looks. And I think Spags is going to give him some looks that may confuse him, and that works to our advantage. And hopefully Frank Clark will be able to play. And we'll be, and, um, oh, real quick, like, BJ, do you think – how do you feel about – this is just an add-on question, like real quick. Like Chris yeah. Jones, I feel like his me and Joe feel like his strength is in the middle and not necessarily on the edge. And um containing the run and being as quick as those guys normally are on the edge to kind of set that that tone. But when he's in the middle, he's very hard to deal with. So yeah, it's a it's a nuanced thing because Chris is so big, he's so athletic, he's so good at getting around defensive linemen. Uh, when getting after the quarterback that he is very valuable inside. But there were a lot of times in the past that he's played end. Mm -hmm. um, they went heavy D end and a lot of times where I think we faced lighter tackles mm -hmm. to kind of collapse where they decide, okay, do we want pressure up the middle or do we want pressure off the edge? And depending upon where you want that quarterback to step is where I think is the reason, depending upon like where we were game planning Chris in years past. Mm -hmm. And now with him just saying, hey, we're going to play him on the end. I think it manifest itself i think we learned against baltimore uh what that can't look like and that's not chris's fault that's not how he's he, he's not going to be the unblocked guy on his own read to get out there and make that play yeah that is a d4 type you need mm -hmm. a an athletic three four outside linebacker who is going to read that play i don't think there's a lot of dns in the league and the ones who can make that play are all pros like mm -hmm. that you that's an all pro DN, not a D tackle that can play a little end yeah. stepping out there. But to the same point, it's not apples to apples with Chris and all right. positives, because when he plays inside, mm -hmm. Chris would do some very creative things to get around his gap and his mm -hmm. blocker <laughs> where he may fit into getting around his guy, but within the scheme of the run fits uh, left hitch out to dry. Mm. <laughs> it's just too nice to say anything. Um, 
some of that had to play into the decision too. And that Chris just, he freelanced a lot up front. He's great. It's not a knock, but as a defensive coach, when you're assigning yeah. responsibilities yeah. and that guy leaves and then it leads to a big play right. and everyone's like, Oh, Chris almost made the play. Somebody else has got to step in and like, Chris is not doing what he's supposed to. Fans mm-hmm. don't want to hear that. Yeah. Um, but from a coach's standpoint, is it easier to tell him to keep your outside shoulder free and just get after the quarterback as opposed to maintaining his gap discipline inside? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I do know that when we face Baltimore again, he better not be the unblocked. You not, better not be playing end in that same situation because I was yeah. pissed in the second half yeah. that we didn't just tell him to go attack the mesh. Like just go hit somebody. Stop trying to read it because you're not going to hit anybody. If you do that, like just go hit Lamar Jackson as hard as you can every time. And maybe they'll just stop calling those plays because they don't want to get their quarterback hit. Like, mm. I know it's high school football, scrape great exchange. Like, just go hit somebody. Don't just stand there. <laughs> yeah. You got, you got something, Joe? I mean, I, I always think about the article. Mm-hmm. I read an article and it was one of the offensive linemen that was describing, you know, what it was like to have to face Chris Jones and, I mean, he used some pretty explicit explicit <laughs> words, but at the end of the day, it was something like, this guy is a beeping monster. He's like, I hate it. He was like, it was a horrible experience all game. <laughs> and that was when he was playing, you know, in the middle of the field. And I think that my thing with it is, is that when I look at a team like Baltimore, I, I, I do hope that we will, you know, reconsider. I do hope that we have Frank back and that he's at, you know, at a, at a healthy point. And not only that, but some of these, you know, the other talent that we've brought in here at DN, let's see some of these guys really get after it. I think you put Chris back where he's comfortable. Uh, I know he's been doing the Pilates thing and all of that, but, hey, you know, said and done, you know, Chris can say what he wants. I know he's lost a little weight, but him and him and Andy are still heading over to, you know, Q39 and stuff. Just stop it and go he's ahead. He's a Joe's and guy. He's in the field. Chris is a Joe's guy. Yeah. Oh, he's a Joe's guy. He's a Joe's I don't guy. need Michael Katz calling me. Wow. You promoted the wrong barbecue spot. Jack Stack. <laughs> Jay, you guys got your own barbecue place. Chris has got Joe's. KC yeah. Sports Network has Jack Stack Barbecue as one of our partners. So, okay. Wow. Um, yeah. yeah. No shortage I'll, of barbecue. I'll get, it, here. I'll get in trouble for Jack Stack because I, I got a neighbor that's a pit master there. And I, mm-hmm. I can tell you right now, y'all hear about that. But yeah, nonetheless, I'm ready to see Chris in the middle being a big, nasty monster again. That's what I want to see. And and real quick before we uh start wrapping up, do you have any news on Willie Gay, BJ? I don't, but I yeah. feel bad for Willie Gay, and this is why. And this happens as narratives amongst fan bases grow. And being on the inside and seeing things kind of turn into something out of nowhere, you set unfair expectations on young players. Case in point, if you follow, you guys follow the Chiefs, Noah Gray, all offseason, we built up Noah Gray as next Travis Kelsey. He's going to do this. He's going to do that. And I wasn't there. I wasn't watching him make athletic plays in shorts during OTAs. I get it. But I kept saying, how much 12 personnel do you think we're going to run? And do you think they're going to take Travis Kelsey off the field? Mm -hmm. So at best, you're talking maybe eight plays a game. Mm -hmm. At absolute best. And that was back in OTAs. And it was like, pump the brakes on this kid because you're going to build it up. And they did it. Everybody was talking about that kid all leading into the preseason. He goes out, drops his first pass. And everyone's like, God, that kid sucks. (laughs) <laughs> he got all excited about him and now he drops the pack. Like we did this, like Twitter did this to this kid. And yeah. I hope it doesn't happen with Willie Gay in the same way that mm. it feels like the narrative around the Chiefs defense is, oh, don't worry, everything's gonna be fixed when Willie Gay comes back. <laughs> like that's not fair to him. He's a second year yeah. player, he's very talented, he's very good. Hopefully that does happen, but like Tyron needs to make plays guys up front need to get off block. Jaron Reed needs to make plays. Daniel Sorensen needs to make tackles. Hitch needs to run through the right gap. Yeah. And like the, the guys on the back end need to get their head around and make, make a play on the ball. Like everybody yeah. needs to step up a little bit. So that's my two cents about Willie Gay is I, I was more excited about Willie Gay than any draft pick in recent memory for the chiefs. He's an energy giver. He's athletic and he runs around and he doesn't care if he's late, makes the wrong thing. He goes hundred miles an hour. Mm -hmm. which is in some ways opposite of Ben Neiman and Daniel Sorensen, who all defend because they're in the right position. They just don't make plays. They don't make the play. And it's like, how, as a coach, 
Mm-hmm. If you guys coached before, you love that guy because he's like, he's where he's supposed to be. He's right there. He's like eight inches away from the ball. Just get your hand up and knock it down. But after years of being like, hey, you're always right there. Just get your hand up and knock the ball down. It's not happening as consistently as you need for guys in those positions to make some plays sometimes. Yeah. So they're in position sometimes to make tackles. You know, I say that, play. but but Sorensen for me, like it, it is frustrating, but like I, I can appreciate you saying, you know, they stay home, which is a discipline thing that you hear in high school coaches all the time. Just stay home. No, do your job. <laughs> he, he's doing Sorensen, his job. Yeah, yeah. Make he's doing play. his job. But the guy, the guy puts – he has those plays like the one where he calls the fumble with his head. He put his, I mean, I can't even think of, I don't know if there's another person in the league that could have intentionally did what he did. It was kind of like a freak of nature thing. Like, dude, you can do this. Then please put your hand up sometime. I don't know how he did it, but I don't know. I, I kind of have a, it's hard. It's hard not yeah. to, not to appreciate him to some extent. Just, so. Winning football teams have guys like Daniel Sorensen on yeah. them. Guys who you're not going to have. Everybody's not going to be an All Pro. The guy was an undrafted free agent. Was a phenomenal special teams player. That if he was just playing special teams, everybody would love him. Like yeah. everybody would love him as a player. They don't like that he's been forced to playing more snaps. And we can have that discussion another time. Oh yeah, why, that, the why, why free, that's free one Thornhill of why that's the case. Yeah, exactly. that's the hashtag why, right now. Yeah, of why man. that's the case um, yeah. regarding Sorensen and field and all that. But at the end of the day, like Sorensen made the one of the biggest tackles in chiefs franchise history. And I'll never, I'm not going to forget that because he goes out and doesn't play well in the regular season. Ian you know, Sorensen on the fake punt tackle against the Texans. Oh, wow. Deserves all the equity for everything. You can be mad. You can say, Hey, he doesn't man. have it anymore. He's got to be done. But you speak about that man with reverence because yeah. without that yeah. tackle, <laughs> the thing imagine is, the Chiefs don't win that game. Imagine we lose to the Texans. Yeah. What do the Texans look like right now if right. we don't win that game? And what right. do we look like as getting blown out in the first round of the playoffs, losing the Super Bowl last year? Like it's a completely different vibe. Yeah. Sorensen, it's like uh, such a love. They say love, hey, it's like because yeah. he, he he misses a lot of tackles, but when he makes that one play, it's always a big play to to that that impacts the game. The Cleveland he's where playoff, you're supposed to be. The Cleveland he playoff. The assignment. Play, he made the play that he was supposed to. Yeah, make. and he made some big plays in the playoffs. So it's like ah, yeah, but that's what we got for today, y'all. Thank you for watching Red and Bold. Right now, we're gonna move to our shout outs. And BJ, who would you like to shout out today? Oh, man. I want to shout out Cookie Society. So we announced the campaign earlier today. Uh, Cookie Society, it's owned by former Chiefs offensive lineman Jeff Allen and his wife, Marissa, actually honored uh, as one of Oprah's favorite things and best gifts last year. So this company has been doing really well. They're based out of Frisco, Texas. Uh, But we have partnered for a campaign we're doing to support teachers in the Kansas City area this year. Uh, where every Friday during the chief season, uh, KC Sports Network, my company, we're going to be sending a hundred of these cookie society cookies uh, to a different school in the Kansas City area um, to give to teachers and school staff. It's just a thank you for everything teachers are having to go through with with COVID and not like not to get political, not to get on that side of it, but just teachers are having to to share the brunt of a lot of stuff right now. My mom was a teacher. My sister is a teacher here in Kansas City, so it's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, but we're trying to do something cool. It's just like a quick little, you know, thank you, a small gesture to let teachers know we're thinking about them and we appreciate what they do. And so a special shout out to Cookie Society for helping us set this up. Uh, and we'll start those deliveries this Thursday and Friday with, with cookies going around to Kansas City. And then for every subscriber we get to our sub stack at KC Sports Network, we're throwing another five cookies to five different teachers in Kansas City for the rest of the year. So trying to do some cool stuff and uh, and give give thanks to teachers the uh, best way that we can. Awesome, love it. I love that, man. And where can um where can everyone follow you and the uh, Kansas City Sports Network on social media? Yeah, no, appreciate that. Yeah, it's uh, at KC Sports Network on Twitter. I uh, also have a, a website that's got all of our content. We do a lot of Chiefs content, but we also cover K State football, Mizzou football, and then KU Mizzou basketball. We've got a new show called Border War. Okay. Um, all of those college shows are hosted by former college athletes. 
So the Making Mizzou, the college football show uh, focused on Missouri. Uh, Martin Rucker, All-American tight end oh, for Rucker. Mizzou, is one of the hosts. Uh, Tommy Saunders, uh, one of his good friends, is a wide res- all Big 12 wide receiver and special yeah. teams player. Uh, he's the co-host for the Making Mizzou. And then K-State, it's John Kurtz. Uh, who's an insider for K-State and the radio station now. But Aaron Lockett of the Lockett family uh, yeah. is one of the co-hosts. And okay. then the college basketball show is Jared Sutton was a point guard at Mizzou. And then Jeff Hawkins uh, was a oh, point man. guard for KU is yeah, the host that. of that show. So you guys know these guys. So yeah. that's the college side of the network. And then on yeah. the, the chief side, it's, it's Jeff Allen, uh, Mike DeVito, both guys who played for coach Reed and the chiefs. Nick Lecky was an all American at K state that I do my show with uh, outside the trenches, talking a little bit of everything. Um, we've actually got a weekly segment is breaking news guys. We have not announced this anywhere, uh, but Matt Castle, is going to be doing a weekly breakdown with us, uh, breaking down a Patrick Mahomes play each week. Oh, so I you love have it. a right. former right. NFL quarterback that we all know absolutely loves Mahomes. He's going to give us that perspective of what a, what he appreciates about watching Patrick Mahomes play, which is going to be a little bit different than everything that we see as fans. He's going to get into that mental acuity stuff, uh, and that starts tomorrow. We'll have that video out. So a lot of cool stuff uh, we're doing at KC Sports Network. But, uh, yeah, those two things are, are new and uh, excited about. That's awesome. I can't wait. I'm looking for I'm gonna <laughs> hey, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be on that website looking for all the shows, checking it all out. I got out. a YouTube YouTube channel anywhere you find podcasts, just see, search KC Sports Network. It's not hard to find. <laughs> We're everywhere. Awesome. And uh except for KU in case not play. <laughs> I'm a Mizzou. I'm a, I grew up in Missouri side, so I'm all Mizzou in my Z. Z O U. They got uh Denario Alexander as the guest on Making oh. Mizzou this week. They've okay. had Mike Alden, they had Drinkwitz, they had uh, Jeremy Macklin came on as a guest. Oh, man. They had Chase Kaufman came on as a guest. So they're killing it with that show. It's it's a good one. Awesome, man. So we're going to move on with shout outs. Thank you, BJ, for those shout outs. And like I said, yeah. we'll be looking forward to every to all, to all those shows on the Kansas City Sports Network. I'll be checking it out. And um, hope we continue to do something else together again soon. So, Joe, awesome. who are your shout outs for today? Um, my shout outs today, give it to you very quickly. I'm still sticking with double double back Z's and Luke Feast in Shiny Mission. Uh, show them some love. And my last shout out is actually going to be Christian Charity Church Food Pantry on third Saturdays. Food Pantry on third Saturdays. We are trying to help everybody that we can. If you are hungry, come see us. And they got really good stuff. I normally try to get them to hold something back for me. That's at <laughs> 11,000 Ruskin Way. That's Kansas City, Missouri, 64134. And th- that starts at 9 o'clock to 11. All you got to do is pull up. They will load your car. Uh, everything is uh, considered, you know, very much uh, safe safe measures in place there to make sure we keep everybody as healthy as we possibly can. Again, that's uh, the food pantry there, Divine Provision. Uh, they're at Christian Charity Church on third Saturday's run through. Double back Z's. Uh, they're in the city right there. Uh, right off of 39th and then if you'll again luffy's over in shiny mission show him some love hey bj it was a a, a real 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 slice of uh, heaven there man i appreciate <laughs> you spending some time with us man thank you yeah, yeah absolutely appreciate, appreciate you guys having me on yeah yeah uh so i'm gonna do my shout outs uh of course you know um i'm in the atlanta area if you are in atlanta and you want some kansas city barbecue check out greedy man's barbecue it's in uh jonesboro georgia oh my goodness mm, apple apple Mm. smoke wings and rib tips Mm. and i had a chicken philly that was just bj if you ever come down to atlanta let me know i want to know sorry i don't mean uh, the The last time somebody said rib tips they're burn ends right like it's the same thing they're not the same okay (laughs) because this is chris jones conversation so we went down to houston mississippi a few years Uh ago and i was working at the chiefs we did a story on uh, Chris Jones hometown we went hung out with him and his family his mom and dad like we were hanging out with his went to see the house that he lived in, in high school with his grandma like it was awesome but he kept talking to us about this gas station he's like we got to stop this gas station and get these rib tips and I was like what a rib t-? he came out with like a brown bag and he's like just it was like falling apart he's like just trust me just eat this stuff just hands me this bag full of just meat in it and I was like whatever dude they were amazing it just, it reminded me of burn in. So I figured it was similar, but you're the first person who said rib tips and it immediately reminded me of Chris Jones coming out. It was me and like two other producers for the chiefs. Uh, we were down there doing the story. He's had like five bags. He literally hit rib tips two. in the city right here. 
J Mo's barbecue. Nobody <laughs> does right. it like us. Come see me, BJ. You can bring right. Chris Jones. I'll make enough rib tips. He he'll or oh, Andy will be mad at me, but Chris will gain 15, 20 pounds <laughs> sitting over here, man. That, yeah. that guy would if you can find rib tips in Kansas City, I know he absolutely loves them because there was that, it. it reminded Don't me of Joe's. Me. It reminded me of like the little hole in the wall gas station. Yeah. And then you just pull out like brown paper bags and the food was just freaking amazing. So yep. gotcha. So if right, you're yeah. ever in Atlanta, BJ, come on, uh hit me up. Hey, and we'll, we'll go it. down to uh greedy man's barbecue. And then yeah. I had like that chicken Philly was so good. That was the most tender chicken. Oh my goodness, the sauce that was on it. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm going to have to make a, another visit down there to give me some, another chicken Philly. But <clears throat> so Greedy Man's Barbecue, that's GreedyMansBBQ.com. Be sure to check it out. Also, we want to um, shout out Bernard's Po' Boys, um, also located in the Atlanta area. Um, uh, New Orleans Styles Po' Boys. They got shrimp Po' Boys, catfish Po' Boys, tilapia, hot sausage sandwich, um, uh, nachos with the shrimp that Joe want to try. <laughs> And so bernardspoboys.com be sure to check them out if you are in the atlanta area my last shout out is a mix ginger juice um it's a healthy uh ginger juice with a uh, lime she has on a uh, flavor of pineapple and so it's um uh, it's very healthy check it out a mix ginger juice i'll put the website below be sure to check her out also and that is it for our show we want to thank you all for joining us um our and we are under MTMV Sports, which is my team, my voice, sports podcast network. And we are for the fans, by the fans. We are simply fans of our team, Joe and I, fans of the Chiefs. And um, so be sure to follow us on Twitter at Red and Bold. That's at R-E-D-A-N-D-B-O-L-D. Be sure to follow BJ Kissel and um, at Kansas City Sports Network. Be sure to follow him, y'all. Check him out. He's going to have all the news in the Kansas City sports area. And so they've got a lot of things covered. So be sure to follow them. Um, be sure if you want to send us a question, send us an email at um, it's red and bold podcast at gmail.com. So red and bold podcast at gmail.com. We'll be sure to answer one of your questions if you have something for us. Thank you again for watching and, and, and viewing and listening. We appreciate all, everybody that watches. Uh, we thank you all. We love you. Have a wonderful, a wonderful week, rest of the week. And let's come back with a Chiefs. W against all those Philadelphia Eagles. Let's get that 100th win. Yes, sir. And I feel like that's going to be real important. You know, Andy was just fell ill and he's come back. And so I think it's going to be real important for the guys that are going to have an extra effort to try, to try to get that 100th win versus his former team. So let's go Chiefs Kingdom. Love y'all.